Good afternoon. Thank you for being here for this presentation that focuses on salmonella. Um, how do I get to my presentation? Let's see. Uh, maybe while this is loading up, I would like to say that um, after three days of um, food safety talks, this audience is likely the last audience who wants to hear about salmonella, perhaps, uh, and its food relevant adaptations. At least, I would expect you don't need to hear more. However, for the next few minutes, I would like to dwell a little bit on some of the life and times, the biology of salmonella in the matrices that we are talking about, low water activity foods, low moisture foods, or LMFs. And why do we need to still think and talk about them? To summarize, we still get a lot of outbreaks, some of them with very serious public health and economic bless you, consequences having to do with low, uh, LMF vehicles, all the way from nuts, spices, pet foods, and so on. In addition, and that's really important, um, once it's in a low moisture food environment, salmonella can become a real remarkable beast to inactivate. So the conditions that would normally control it when it's there on a raw poultry or in milk may well not work when it's there in peanut butter or on spices. And last, we worry about salmonella as they, thank you, we worry about salmonella as they um, can grow and we can still recover them from low, from low moisture foods. But we become increasingly, we're becoming increasingly aware that we also need to concern ourselves with cells that may be there and alive, but we cannot see them forming colonies on media, on, in, on laboratory media, the so-called viable but non-culturable VBNC state. And those cells may be infectious. So there is some several challenges with salmonella when it comes to these, to these matrices. The objectives of this project was to use the same foods that Dr. Farber mentioned, um, six different food products. They were actually, as he mentioned, the same batches. Um, and they represent some of the major types of foods that are implicated in salmonellosis outbreaks via LMFs. We also wanted to assess the virulence of salmonella as it survives once it gets dried onto the LMFs and as it survives over various periods of time. And in a third objective, to look at the genome uh, expression profile, the transcriptome profile of the organisms as they survive on, this, on these products. We will uh, focus in this presentation on the first two objectives. Now, we obtained a panel of salmonella strains. Those represented different serotypes. Uh, serotypes relevant to different outbreaks uh, involving LMFs. And um, we also characterized the foods that, as I mentioned, were the same as for the other, as for the Listeria study. And uh, we, um, we did a series of survival and virulence assessments. Let me summarize our methods. So here we talk about, here we summarize the, the survival assessment methods. We used uh, the strains in a cocktail. For the transcriptome study, which actually we will not talk much about here, we used uh, Salmonella enteritidis, PT30, but for the survival assessments, we use a five-strain cocktail, the cocktail that I showed you just in the previous slide. We inoculated using wet inoculation. We used um, um, a, high, a high inoculum so we can monitor survival over a long period of time. Um, periodically, we store them in the dark at 22 degrees. Periodically, we enumerate the cells via culture on both selective and non-selective media. And for selected applications, we also assess survival using the live dead stain. And this shows pictures of our products and the way they were inoculated and, and dried. And for virulence, we use the greater wax mo uh, moth model, honeycomb moth, that's a, 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 an insect that uh, it doesn't cause disease in um, bees, but beekeepers hate it because it's kind of messy. It eats the wax. Uh, and um, it's called Galeria. And we basically get the rinsate from the inoculated foods. And we adjust the uh, numbers so that we have similar numbers in the di from the different products. And we inoculate um, 10 microliters per larva. 
and then we monitor mortality of the larvae. So this is actually a mortality assessment model. Uh, a virulent bacteria will not kill these uh, animals, but with increasing levels of virulence, you see increased mortality. And we assess, we assess the mortality over five days. And we actually assess the mortality at 37 degrees. One of the reasons people love this model is because you can actually assess virulence at 37 degrees. Now, let's look a little bit at the survival. So for, I'm showing here the data for chocolate, pistachios, and cornflakes. We inoculated high levels, and a lot of the decrease in colony forming units that we see actually takes place as the bacteria dry to the original water activity. So once we inoculate, we dry them to the original water activity, and that's where we see quite a bit of loss of culture of uh, colonies. Now, for uh, pistachios and cornflakes, we see a progressive loss as time goes by. We, we saw here data over 250 days. These are ongoing assessments, so we will have longer time spans when the project is completed. And um, you can see there that for, for chocolate, that's the, the, the blue line here, we actually have, once they drop after the inoculation and then drying to the original inoculum, there is actually fairly little loss of, of um, colony forming units with time. Now, I mentioned here that when it came time to dried fruit, and we tried all the three different types of dry food, uh, fruit, we actually, by the time they dry to the original water activity, we could not detect any colony forming units. So let's look at, at that a little bit uh, in more detail. So um, upon, after inoculation, we start with a certain number of, of colony forming units, and then as we say here, they become, we basically cannot recover anything, uh, either on selective media or on non-selective media. Um, at, upon uh, reaching the original water activity. And um, efforts were made to enrich, efforts were made to grow them aerob uh, microaerophilic, microaerobically, anaerobically, and even so we were not able to recover any colonies on, on these media under any of these conditions. As part of the project, I mentioned that we were going to be uh, do, uh, analyzing the transcriptome of Salmonella upon prolonged time on these uh, LMFs. And we're actually choosing three LMFs for the transcriptome work. That's cornflakes, pistachios, and dried apples. We could not uh, include sal uh, chocolate because it became the messiest, stickiest, <laughs> unmanageable um, product once we melted it and tried to inoculate and so on. So we actually have these three products. Uh, and we also included dried fruit. And we noticed, uh, so for this method, we actually spot inoculated so that drying time was shorter. And we noticed that we have um, a progressive decline with, uh, with uh, pistachios and with the uh, cornflakes. And with the dried fruit, we don't go right to, to getting nothing upon drying, but it does decline very, very steeply. It, it simulates very closely what Dr. Farber showed actually with, um, with the listeria on the dried fruit. So this is on dried apples. And here, we saw the dried apples in a little bit higher resolution, and we get basically the same data on selective and non-selective media. And after 40 days, we, don't, we no longer get any colony forming units, uh, with a, starting with a very high inoculum and um, having as high as uh, you know, 10 to the 7 um, in, in this time period. So they decline very, very steeply. However, what triggered our curiosity was that this same preparation, these same samples that gave us no colonies, no matter what we did to help them uh, grow on the media, they yielded very good quality RNA. In fact, from the quality, based on the quality of the RNA and the qPCRs that Victor was doing, we could not tell any impacts on RNA quality or stability. So as you know, uh, when the cells die, the RNA, the RNA starts getting degraded. RNA is a stable molecule. So that got us to suspect that maybe these cells were not actually uh, dead, and that maybe, maybe some of them had died, but there was a lot of viable cells there enough to give high quality RNA. And actually, uh, that led us to, um, to think some more about the issue. But before we actually came to that conclusion that we were dealing with um, 
uh, potential, potentially viable cells that were not forming colonies. We wanted to see how general this phenomenon was with other uh, apples in this case. And also at the time we did not, we, at the time we didn't know about the product enough. So we suspected maybe sulfites uh, might have been um, making the bacteria um, basically not, not, reco not recoverable. It turns out actually these apples were not treated with, sulf with sulfur dioxide. But in the meantime, we actually did um, get some apples from retail and uh, that was Red Delicious and Granny Smith. Those are the ones that we had from Dr. Farber, from the supplier. And um, we dried them in the lab and we inoculated and monitored survival. And you can see here that after seven days drying um, on either on non-selective media or on selective media, um, these continue to not give any colonies. Granny Smith dried apples, home dried apples, also gave no colonies. These ones, the Red Delicious, yielded some, some colonies increasingly, uh, with increasingly low counts. So it appears to be something that's not limited to this batch. Uh, to this batch, it appears to be something that, uh, for reasons that we don't totally know, as with the listeria data, when these bacteria are dried and um, allowed to, to stay on the dried apples, they cannot be coaxed to making colonies very well. So, so to, to test whether maybe these cells were actually alive, even though they could not make colonies, we used a live dead stain, a commercial stain, fluorescent, a fluorescent stain, and the live cells uh, stain green and the dead cells are red. I don't know if you can see that here, but uh, this is the live cells on the green filter, the red filter, and the two filters overlaid. And actually we can see based on this uh, stain that a, a pretty substantial fraction of the cells, when you count them, actually the greens are more than the reds, appear to be viable cells. And that would support the RNA quality data that we're having. So, so now, in the meantime, and while we're trying to figure these things out, another uh, angle in our lab uh, looked at uh, survival and um, recovery of salmonella from an abiotic surface, a non-food surface. We wanted, what prompted that is we wanted to see where what we were seeing actually specific to dried foods, or is it something that salmonella would do on any dried situation? And we used uh, nitrocellulose as a model abiotic surface. And there were two reasons, actually, in addition to the, what, to the one that I mentioned. One is survival on dried surfaces is relevant for salmonella in food production and food processing. Bacteria can be transferred and dried onto a surface, and they can be without water, without nutrient, without growth, but they can persist. So this is a relevant situation. And the other thing is, we, uh, this setup allows us to screen multiple strains for survival on this surface. And the multiple strains were actually a multi-gene deletion library that we got from Dr. Michael McClelland. It's an order deletion library of Salmonella typhimurium. And so the assay is actually very simple. So the bacteria are um, spotted on the nitrocellulose. They're allowed to dry, they're dried there at uh, 22 degrees for several days. And then we take those bacteria, the dried bacteria, uh, nitrocellulose, and overlay on a nutrient agar. And we see what grows and what doesn't. And you can see here, for instance, this strain, that was the original collection that we spotted. So everything grew in the original, but here, you see that this one, when you, put the nit when you overlay the nitrocellulose on the agar, this particular mutant didn't grow, neither did this or this. And I'm putting this here because I didn't want to forget it. We actually are looking more closely at one of these mutants, that this guy here that, didn't grow, that didn't, was, could not be recovered from the nitrocellulose after 16 days drying on it. Um, and this mutant actually, um, you can see that the wild type salmonella when you grow it, many of you may know that when you grow salmonella at low temperature and uh, over a long period of time, it produces a very specific phenotype. It's called the red, dry, rough, or radar phenotype. Um, the curli, those are the, the thin aggregate uh, fimbria on the surface, that those are actually amyloid fibers. Uh, they network the cells together and it forms this very specialized 
pattern on the, on the colonies. And the, the mutant, this one that didn't survive, actually lacked that typical radar phenotype. And I will come back to that briefly in a couple of minutes. Now, um, so we characterize the survival of, these, uh, of several of these mutants. And here is this one that um, lacked the radar phenotype. And there were two others, this one and this one, that also did not survive. After 24 hours drying on the nitrocellulose, their recovery was below detection. So they had severely impaired survival on the dry abiotic surface. And uh, looking at what genes are deleted in Dr. McClellan's library in these mutants, uh, you can see here that these are, this, this mutant lacks a number of genes. The CSG, CSG genes are curly specific genes. That's what the CSG means. And um, so at some level, maybe it's not so surprising because some early work from Mike Soret's lab had shown that mutants in this, that lack this thin aggregative fibrie, fibrie do not survive well on plastic, on abiotic, he used plastic as an abiotic surface. And another one that was very promising, uh, I'm sorry, it's, um, yep. it's uh, this one, let's see. The one that says BO3, one line above the, the end, this is actually the type 1 fimbria of salmonella. It's a very important antigenicity, did any surface antigen, extremely important for various adaptations. Uh, we have not yet characterized this mutant as very further in regarding its survival. And the last one, my laser stopped working, so I'll, the last one, the, the DO8, is, uh, the, is missing several genes having to do with sodium ion transport. So, um, so we, take, we took one of those mutants, the radar phenotype mutant that lacks the, the that's, that's, uh, clearly lacks the curli, and we tested its survival on uh, pistachios. And you can see here the wild type uh, has this, some decrease and then remains, it retains very high uh, recovery of colonies over a long time. And the D, this mutant actually shows a significantly impaired um, recovery of colonies with time. Uh, so it's, this is kind of like proof of principle that screening mutants with this assay can actually help us get to genes that may also be important for survival on the dry, on the dry um, low moisture foods. Now the other uh, objective was to test virulence over time uh, as, the, as the bacteria sit on these um, low moisture foods. And uh, basically, as I mentioned, the virulence assay looks at how how many of the, of the animals die over time. So we do it over five days. Okay, and this is actually right after the bacteria were dried on the low moisture foods. That's the foods that we used. We adjusted the, the colony, the, the inoculum, so that we have similar inoculum from the different foods, and also similar inoculum from the lab-grown cultures as a control, and from the nitrocellulose as an abiotic surface control. And we see, actually, it was interesting. We see that the lab-grown cultures and the nitrocellulose-derived cells uh, are very similar in virulence. You, ve you see very similar um, survival um, mortality, actually, curves as time goes. And the three, and the, the, the bacteria derived from the three foods right after drying are also very similar among themselves. But they are different to this. So their, their virulence seems to be lower. You have larger numbers of, larger percent of survival in the bacteria, in the animals that were inoculated with the bacteria from the low moisture foods. And if, you, if we look also at the bacteria after 45 days on the low moisture foods, you see a fairly similar um, cur uh, situation. The ones from the abiotic surface uh, are, are tip show typical virulence, and these ones do have virulence, but it's less than the lab culture or the nitrocellulose. And, um, so, so the conclusion is that as, you inocu as we inoculate the bacteria onto these foods, they retain virulence, but the virulence is significantly lower than lab-grown cells or cells from an abiotic surface. And this summarizes the statistical analysis. Um, and this is after drying to the original inoculum, and this is after getting these bacteria for uh, after 45 days, that's the blue bars, and 90 days, that's the red bars. So you have similar mortality 
Um, this is actually after 24 hours uh, of infecting the animals, but we see similar trends with, um, with the whole period of the five days. Now, so the question is, what about the bacteria from those apples, right? So the ones from the pistachios, chocolate, and cereal are still virulent, less so, but still virulent. What about those from the apples where we cannot get any colonies to grow? So actually, this is still something we're trying to, to learn about and to understand more. However, the current data suggests that even though the bacteria from the dried apples do not show the same degree of killing, we don't see the animals dying the way they die when they're inoculated from the, with the bacteria from the other LMFs. Nonetheless, nonetheless, it seems like the animal can tell that there is salmonella there. Because when they're, inocu when they're mock inoculated with just water or PBS, they're nice and they have that yellow color, they look very healthy. But when they are inoculated with the salmonella from the dried apples, you can see they're beginning to melanize, uh, their color is, um, is impaired, so there seems to be a response to the presence of the bacteria. We're still trying to understand this, this situation better. So, to, and to conclude and to tell you what else we want to do, we see survival uh, trends. Our assays were done at 22 degrees. The survival trends were the pistachios, chocolate, and um, cereal actually confirmed previous findings from the Harris group and many other groups. Um, the survival curves from the apples support those find, found with listeria by Dr. Um, Farber's group. Um, we have an interesting situation with the dried fruit, and actually we saw that with all types, with all three types of the dried fruit, that RNA quality is intact, appears intact, um, but we cannot get these bacteria to form colonies. And um, we, can actually, we can actually use a deletion library as a tool to help us understand more about what happens on the low moisture foods. And um, we found at least one such strain, which does have impaired survival. And when it comes to um, infectiousness from the dried fruit, we still, not to, we still need to know more about the situation there. And when it comes to the transcriptional changes, we need to know a lot about what's going there. We are just barely starting that part of the, of the project. So with that, I would like to thank Ilse for supporting the study and for inviting us here. Uh, we're very grateful. We, like, we would like to thank uh, colleagues who very generously provided reagents and advice and insights. Um, Dr. Marx, Dr. Anderson, Dr. McClellan, Dr. Zhang. Um, those were essential reagents and tools for us. And of course, Victor, who is doing his PhD, not his master's. Um, he probably cringed when he <laughs> he's doing his PhD in our lab and our lab group. And that picture is a little bit old, but I still am the smallest. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for your attention. We do have one very tall person now, so if you ask me. <laughs> well, we have a couple minutes for questions. Are there any questions for Dr. Cathario? Dr. Bouchard. Very good. Uh, Larry Bouchard, University of Georgia. Your results with the survival on the dried fruit are quite different than our observations. Okay. Uh, we did not use the same serotypes, um, but we did use a dry inoculum and a mist inoculum okay. on four different fruits. I believe it was raisins, cranberries, um, strawberries, and date paste. Okay at two different temperatures, and as I recall, it's 22 and 4. Okay. And we got better survival at 4 than 22, as did right, uh, Jeff right, with the listeria. Right. But we had survival in some cases six months or longer on, on these fruits. So I'm wondering... Yeah, that's how, very thought-provoking. Yeah, and I would very, love to talk to you more about this, um, yeah. because we actually did these experiments, especially with the apple, we couldn't believe them. And at the time, we didn't know that Dr. Farberg was getting similar results with Listeria, so we thought that maybe it was something with the method. Um, so we did them multiple times, so I would very much like to talk to you more and get yeah. more insights. Maybe the inoculation method. Yeah. I know that when we inoculated them, when we spot inoculated them, they survive longer, yeah. but they still plummet. I know by, by a month later, we cannot culture them. Yeah. yeah, it may be something in the case of apple in the apple. 
components other than uh, AW that's affecting it. Yeah, we, we know it's not sulfides, but yeah. we don't know much more about the apple. Right. You're it's right. It's fairly low pH. Yeah. yeah, yeah, low pH. Yeah, the pH yeah. was around between three and four yeah. uh, in the dried apples. Maybe the high sugar content, you know? Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Thank We're you trying very much. to figure it out. I would love to. We will, we will be talking more to you. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the great uh, presentation and information. Just a quick question on, uh, two questions actually. One is, um, did you analyze, even with the LM study, uh, the composition of the food to see what the protein, fat, or those levels, you know? Uh, there are in some findings that in salmonella, you know, different matrices, it, it tend to hide in, in fat, you know, stuff like that. So that's another one question. The other one is, um, I mean, bear with me, my, my you know, limit, limited knowledge on this. Why you started to look at the survival with, with a very high, high log level? I would assume that to see the reduction. But what's the industry application? Uh, what would be the industry application with, with this study? Um, just curious to know. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So the, the first question concerned the, the composition, the ingredient composition of the food. Um, we have some data, some data from the foods. It's something we want to know much more about. We would love to know. And this is going to be especially import, important for survival, but also especially important for the transcriptome analysis, because different fat content, different um, sugar and protein content would have a big yeah. difference. It's a very good point. We, we, are, we are thinking about it. Okay. We do not have the data. And the second question about the, were you asking about the virulence implications? No, of uh, the industry application. So it started with the- Of the, so the, the, of the virulence data? So, or? Sorry, if I rephrase it, so the product is already processed, and then you bring in salmonella and listeria to study the sur survival, mm -hmm. which kind of makes sense. But if you really think about any, any critical step that to get rid of the pathogen is already uh, yes. being done. So yeah. we wouldn't expect this much high level of any of the pathogens in a, f in a food matrix yeah. uh, after the kill step. So just curious, you know, what would be the industry application mm -hmm. with these yeah. research findings? So, these, so this work was designed, in, for, for all of us, was designed to simulate what might happen in a low moisture food that becomes contaminated by the pathogens. Now, it could become contaminated by the pathogens before the drying or after the drying. If it becomes contaminated after the drying, it can be, this data would suggest it's a pretty problematic situation because we lose actually a lot of the culturable cells during the process of drying to the original water activity. So now, with that said, you're raising a very important point. The bacteria that may contaminate the, the, low, the low moisture foods in the industry they do not come from agar plates the way we, you know, we grew them on agar plates because we, literature suggests and we confirm that when you grow bacteria, salmonella on agar, it survives longer on the, low, on the LMFs than when you grow them planktonically. That said, you know, we're talking about very different physiological states, let's say from bacteria that may be in the feces of a rodent or I on see. a surface in yeah. a processing plant. No. So those are all simulations of well, what might happen that's in a good artificial point. I scenarios. Thought, of, thought about that part because if it's a spot inoculation like a feces from a rodent or feces from yeah, a, you know. Yeah, very different bacterial yeah. states. But you know, it's so difficult to actually mimic such contamination right. events. So we are looking at the simplest, something that's amenable to the lab and readily reproducible. Because if you are looking at, say, fecal contamination, you know, it will be very difficult to standardize that among different labs and so on. Thank you so much. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks.